Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another Thursday. We have 30 minutes to discuss the case. I'm excited today to discuss Rafe Rally. And if anyone has a case and want to present for us, please let us know. And yeah. Hey, Robbie, how are you today? Hello, hello. I'm doing very, very well. I am uh, on the inpatient ward, so in the hospital working. And um, I'm a little uh, tired because I when I do this, I have to work for a month straight. So I, um, I'm feeling a little bit, but I'm also a little bit sad because it's my last time doing this for a month. Um, and it's really cool because I get to hang out with the same team and the same resident and the same students and I work with them for a whole month. It's very, very unique and very a lot of fun. But um, it's the last time I get to do it because everyone is now moving to two weeks. So tired and a little bit sad. But you know what fixes those things? Hanging out with this crowd every time. It's, it's like it's like a it's like the IV happiness through an IV. Um, yeah, I see that. Um, I see the uh, glorious CP Solvers team members have their video on. It's incredible. If you are here, please, 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 if you can't turn your video on, it makes it that much that much more fun to engage and chat with you. Deborah, I talked a lot. How are you? How are you feeling? I'm good. Yeah. Excited for a discussion. It's always good to learn with you all. And when I don't know something, I always have someone in the chat that's such an amazing thought. So, yeah. 100%. Um, I think if no one has a case, Jazz has one. Let's do it. Do you want to say hi, Jazz? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jazz, Chief Resident at University of Rochester Family Med Department. Uh, we'll be uh, a hospice come September of 2023, so pretty excited about that. Uh, yeah, thanks. I have a case that I saw as a uh, attending on our medicine service, which uh, hopefully should be a good discussion. Amazing. Thanks, Jazz. I see that somebody has been very, very nice to turn on their video. Marielle, hi. Thank you for turning on your video. Hi. Hello. It's so Thank nice you. to meet you. Where yeah. are you coming from? Uh, well, I I actually from Brazil, Amazing. but I live in Maryland. So in Maryland. the first time, yeah, it's the first time that I am participating. <laughs> well, welcome. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you for introducing yourself, for joining, and we're very, very excited to have you. Okay. Um, uh, one of your uh, a close by neighbor, Ravi, has just joined. He's also in the in that general area, not quite in Maryland, uh, but very close by. Nice, thank you. Welcome. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> All right, Jess, take it away, please. Awesome. All right, so this is a 71 year old male with a past medical history of hypertension who pre uh, presented initially to his PCP. So I'm gonna give a little bit of history first. So we saw this patient in the hospital in March, but he initially started having a cough like early December and the cough didn't really improve with time and uh, home remedies. He then started having um, some nasal congestion, he went to his PCP, they gave him a, a uh, trial of Augmentin given for concern for sinusitis that didn't really help his symptoms. Um, went back because the cough would worsen and the entire time was non-productive. Um, and that second time got a short course, five days of prednisone, 40 milligrams, uh, which probably helped his cough for maybe a day or two, but then came back again. Um, fast forward, to maybe like a couple of days before um, coming into the emergency department, he went to see his PCP again. Uh, PCP prescribed him some uh, antibiotics, unclear which, which ones this time around, and got a chest X-ray. Um, the chest X-ray showed, um, let's see here. So interval development of bilateral patchy airspace opacification concerning for bilateral pneumonia versus pulmonary edema. It, once the PCP saw this 
uh, x-ray told him to go to the emergency department. And at that time, his oxygenation was 81% on room air on ambulation. I'll pause there. Oh my gosh, Deborah, you said you wanted heme, but I think uh, <laughs> you're getting what I think is your favorite, uh, which is pulmonary. So hello, yeah. <laughs> thank you Jazz, for that. Can I ask you, Deborah, um, just to, because I know you are very strong in pulmonary, I'll ask you uh, just to move us along. Um, <laughs> What do you? What did you hear that was most worrisome for you? That really got you to worry. Mm. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. Maybe if this cough makes me worry, um, I was wondering what could be the cause of this patient being coughing for so long. And if the patient has like uh, hypertension, if has any kind of immunosuppression, if the patient is um, taking all the medication, if the patient, I don't know, and can be more, can, can have like an infection. Um, and I was thinking that it's a long time for this cough and maybe like study the patient to see how, how the patient is doing, how, um it has any exposure has any if the patient smoke if the patient had some recent travel how the patient leave uh, which work the patient has or if he's retired um and yeah and i think with this saturation i would definitely like put an, a mask in the patient and do an ebg to see how is it and i think that that's where i will start I think that's superb. You're getting on many things that I think will be very important. If you had to either say this is a patient with cough or say this is a patient with hypoxemia, which one would you use in the emergency room? Which problem representation? Um, I think with the hypoxemia. Yeah. Can you explain why? Why is that? Why are you using hypoxemia? Because I think that's the correct answer. Honestly, in my mind, I'm ignoring the cough. I think sad of 81%, very, very uh, attention grabbing. So why do you think your mind wants to focus on hypoxemia? I think with the saturation, we can think about that. And from the time of the patient is having that, and maybe um, if he's not feeling comfortable with the patient, look like how how much the patient like it how is his activity, if he can walk, if he can go buy something in a supermarket and don't feel like with shortness of breath, how, how much that it's impacting the patient life, I think that's, and then go for all the criteria of, of hypoxemia that we have, I think, Patrick. I, com I completely agree with you. I think that if you think about a uh, cough, cough can be from a problem in the throat, a problem in the neck, a problem in the chest, a problem in the brain, a problem so many places. The presence of hypoxemia confirms that the cough is coming from the lungs, inside deep in the lungs. So the cough is essentially helping us solve hypoxemia. Hypoxemia is a much more serious, much bigger problem. And the presence of cough here localizes the hypoxemia, uh, the, the presence of cough merely confirms that the hypoxemia is pulmonary in origin rather than something else. So I'll give you a better example. Somebody has headache and has weakness in the right side of their body. Well, how is the headache helpful? It's helpful because it tells you that the localization of right-sided weakness is not neuropathy, not muscle, not spinal cord. It's in the brain. So I think in a patient who has hypoxemia, cardiac, lung, so many things, the presence of cough is just a small clue. So even though the patient is saying cough, 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 the most efficient way of solving this problem is to frame it as hypoxemia with cough. Cough is a small part here. And so I think, as you said, the key thing will be to focus on the hypoxemia. 
And exactly what you said about his exposure history, his immunosuppression history, are all things that are going to help you solve hypoxemia. And I just wanted to, uh, to make that clear to everybody. This is not a case of cough. This is a case of hypoxemia with the cough localizing the hypoxemia, triggering Deborah's excellent questions about his immune status, his host, what he does for exposure. Like, why do you need to know all those things? You need to know all those things because they're related to hypoxemia. So excellent uh, questions, Deborah. Um, any other questions that you have in general or things you wanted to say that are important now before we get uh, more from Jess? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think we can continue. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, Jess, tell us more. All right, great discussion from both of you. Um, so a little bit more history. Um, so this patient has not recently or even remotely traveled. Um, he retired over 20 years ago, but when he used to work, he used to make and polish mirrors in the 1980s and used to and was exposed to certain um, agents such as acetone and chlorothane, um, but did say that he wore a mask. Um, most of the time when he used to work with these agents. He does not have any pets. Um, he, uh, his, in his current housing situation, he does not have, uh, he doesn't, he does, like his heating and cooling systems are ductless and there are excessive amounts of fine granular dust that he has noticed, but he vacuums almost every day. And this has not been an issue in the past. Um, he does not smoke or vape or use any inhalation drugs. Um, his actually, despite being 71, he's in very good health. Um, maybe goes for maybe anywhere between three to four mile walks every other day. Uh, and that's when he started to get more concerned is when he started noticing that he was not able to walk more than half a mile before getting tired um, and exhausted. So what happened was when he first came into the ED, they put him on room, I mean, on nasal cannula oxygen and his oxygen saturation initially went up to 95%. His vitals in the ED were as follows, blood pressure of 110 over 64, pulse of 68, afebrile, 97.7 degree Fahrenheit, exactly. Um, he had a respiratory rate of 22, um, he was pleasant, con conver uh, conversational, was able to speak full sentences. And his lung exam was notable for diffuse ex and expiratory wheezing. And his heart exam was completely normal. And no other abnormalities were noted. No skin rashes, no, lo no lower extremity edema. Abdomen was benign as well. Um, and then in terms of, um, his hospital course, maybe literally several hours later, he starts requiring more oxygen requirement and ends up, um, requiring high flow nasal cannula of oxygen. And in our institution, if that happens, they need to go to the ICU. So he was actually sent down to the ICU. Um, I will give you guys the initial lab work that was obtained. So. This is when he first presented to the ED. He had a leukocytosis of 12.7. That was predominantly neutrophilia at 10.0. His um, electrolytes were basically, and his CMP was basically normal. His DK was also normal. Um, and for those who are wondering, creatinine was at his baseline of 0.91. Um, and he had uh, urine strep and urine legionella scent that was negative. And his UA in general was also uh, normal. I mean, for some cloudy urine, but uh, specific gravity was normal. Uh, there was like plus one protein, no blood, uh, no other abnormalities in the urine. I'll pause there um, before I give further information. Deborah, isn't it amazing that everything you asked for, occupational history, immune status, everything, you made it clear why you wanted that, and now you got all that information. Um, so now maybe instead of telling us what you're thinking, can you try something a little harder, which is 
tell us what you think the problem is. So what would be your problem representation to help it make it clear to some of the early learners why you are thinking what you're thinking? So what, what is your updated problem representation, you think? Mm, my problem representation would be a 71 years old male with uh, chronic cough and hypoxemia that um, I'm thinking, <laughs> wait. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, hard, it's very hard. Take your time, there's no rush. That, yeah, it's chronic and mm -hmm. presented a chest X-ray that show bilateral patch or space of opacification and had low saturation. Uh, and an, uh, a past medical history of hypertension and an exposure to uh, to things like uh, acetone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I will Hello. go for the. Yeah. I will start there. I think you should pay attention to something that you did very well, which is one you gave the time course. The time course is really interesting. He's had this for three months, and Deborah, you said nothing about any organ except the lungs. You noticed that. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, you can use that observation. And in uh, in the U.S., we commonly use the word isolated <clears throat> to signify that everything that you're talking about is lungs only. So I would agree with you. I think this is a 71-year-old man coming in with a subacute to chronic, isolated pulmonary disease as evidenced by cough, hypoxemia, and chest x-ray infiltrate. And I'm really curious what you think of the fact that it's only the lungs. So how does the fact that there is no other organ involvement, uh, what does that do for you in terms of what you think is going on? I was thinking maybe if the exposure of what you used to work with, it could be like an interstitial lung disease, mm -hmm. if that could cause uh, by this exposure. And the like the wheezing, like sometimes we always think maybe about asthma, but you know, can be other causes. Like, uh, we had like a, some time ago on uh, student PMR patient with wheezing and had like amyloidosis in the trachea. Uh, nothing, just an example that could be something else. And yeah, I think that are my thoughts. I think it's absolutely superb. I hope you pay attention to what you just did there because you're saying that how can somebody have some something so bad in their lung and it just, just be in their lungs? And I think the most likely explanation is an exposure. And, you know, most people you have to think, do they have an infection? We have to still think that. But by the time you have an infection this bad, you're at least a little bit tachycardia, a little bit hypotension, a little bit of AKI. If you have some cancer, my gosh, three months of cancer and no AKI, no neuro, no skin, nothing, you know? So I would say the fact that this is so deeply affecting the lungs should make us prioritize a pulmonary syndrome. And then, as you said, it's all about the exposure. Maybe a, a question for everybody. Um, but if you have an opinion, Deborah, please uh, let us know. Why do you think Jas told us the CK? It's a very important test in this patient. But why? There's no muscle issue here. There's no weakness. Yeah. So I think the only thing that can sneak up on you is autoimmune diseases that are autoimmune ILDs, like Deborah just mentioned. And one of them are the myopathies. So now that you've had some more time to think, Deborah, um, what other thoughts do you have about this patient? And what, what do you want to do next? Um, I think I want to see an EBG. I think uh, ask for a test, uh, CT. Mm -hmm. I think that, that where I would go. Yeah, agreed. I think the CT is going to be the most helpful test here, and the ABG will confirm how bad the hypoxemia is. Deborah, have you had any uh, real life experience asking about exposures in your um, training? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Any advice from that experience? Like, I don't know if I have any advice. Like, sometimes when I'm, I'm, I'm I don't know, I don't want to ask. Like, I'm ashamed of ask if the person, I don't know, had contact with drugs. I, I just do the question. I just go, do you smoke, use it, drugs or alcohol? I ask all at the same time so I don't have to be thinking much and don't be ashamed about asking the person something. So I don't know. I don't know if it's the best advice, but this is how I do it. I think you're being very honest about how hard it is to get good thorough exposure history. It's very hard. And so even though you may not know it, you have to look at the CT and the CT sometimes is very suggestive of exposure. And sometimes patients don't tell you for the most cute reasons. I had a patient who had hypersensitivity pneumonitis from a bird, but he knew that as soon as he brought the bird, he started to get sick, but he did not want to lose the bird. So he didn't tell us about the bird. Even though the CT was saying bird, 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 he said, there is no bird. Uh, and we ultimately found out because his son came and told us about the bird. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, Deborah, that is really good advice. It's hard to ask and it's hard to know because there are so many exposures. Um, so I would say even in this case, if we don't get a strong exposure history, the CT will be very, very important. Amazing. All right, Jazz, tell us more. Great, awesome. Uh, so this next eloquent will have a lot of information. If if I'm speaking too fast, please let me know and I'll slow down. Um, so basically in the ICU, they got a whole bunch of stuff. So COVID, flu, RSV, all negative. Um, they also got a full respiratory panel that tests for whole sorts of viruses, all negative. The blood cultures and sputum cultures eventually did come back negative. Um, patient does not have any history of immunosuppression. Um, and you guys asked for an ABG. This was obtained like right when he was started the high flow nasal cannula and his pH was 7.47 with a PCO2 of 24, PO2 of 68, and a bicarb of 17. And then um, they also... Um, obtained uh, autoimmune serologies, which included ANA, ANCA, rheumatoid factor, SSA, SSB, SCL770, um, and S, um, C3C4, all of, uh, including anti-JO, anti-CCP, um, uh, uh, sorry, an RNP Smith. They also checked an HIV. All of these were unremarkable. They also obtained a BNP, which was normal. It was, I think it was like 150. Um, and then they also obtained an echo, which showed um, an EF of 69% and no valvular abnormalities. And they also obtained a CT scan with IV contrast, which showed extensive ground glass opacities within the lungs bilaterally, sparing the left base with and some extent to the right base. The radiologist wrote, most etiologies most likely include infection slash infl inflammation versus edema. Um, I'll pause there. Oh, and just sorry, one more thing. In the ICU, they also had him on vancosin. When the MRSA swab came back negative, they de-escalated the vanc to ceftriaxone. So those the antimicrobial coverage. And in terms of the ICU course, despite three days of this, still wasn't really improving on the high flow. It was still on, I think, about 14 to 15 liters. What do you think, Deborah? Thank you, Jess. We have like a lot of information here. So um, a lot of things like we can start taking off the table because uh, things like negative. Um, Everything like all the infections, the patient is not immunosuppressed, but maybe the ground glass opacity made me think about PJP, maybe pneumonia that could be a cause, or even the patient doesn't have any immunosuppression. That would be something that I would maybe look for. But uh, ground glass opacity is not like um, specific; can be like the intertitial lung disease the, from the exposure can be a sarcoidose, can be um, 
I'm thinking. Can be a COVID, but it's negative too. Can be like an edema. So I, I'm thinking maybe get like a, a, a pulmonary of lung test that how, it's how we say the test of pulmonary that we see if it's a obstructive or a restrictive disease. Maybe it would be something that I would look for. What do you think, uh, Robbie? I'm just, I just hope you watch this case again because from the very beginning, you are now, now it's a, now you know what the problem is. You're like, if I know what these GGO is, I know the answer, right? Whatever this GGO is the answer to this case. And I think that um, the reason I was, just to be explicit, um, asking you harder and harder questions is finding the place that you can grow the most in this case and to show people just how strong your knowledge is. Because initially you could solve, try to think, what is cause of cough? No. What is the cause of hypoxemia? And then very quickly, you changed it into what is the cause of just lung being sick, just the lung. And that took you to a very specific pathway, which is you need a CT scan, right? And so it's not easy to know what tests you need in this patient. I think you made it very clear. And so now the question is, what is the cause of these GGOs? And I think that the most important causes are to think of the three infections that cause GGOs, which is um, uh, viral infections like CMV, PJP, and strongyloides. He doesn't have any obvious risk factors for why he would get any of those three infections, but people may have hidden immunosuppression uh, that may be age-related or may be hard to recognize. So that's one possibility. This might be pus. The other possibility is that he uh, this might be blood and he has diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. That is unlikely to be limited to the lungs and often there's a kidney clue and he did not have any hematuria. So that's less likely. Um, so uh, could it be uh, uh, said pus, those three things, could it be blood? Could it be cancer? Very possible, but unlikely for three months not to have spread anywhere else. So I think the real practical next step that is often done in these patients is to sample the fluid to see if you find evidence of blood or the bronchoscopy, sorry, to sample the fluid with the bronchoscopy to see if you find evidence of blood to see if you find evidence of infection with PJP, CMV, or strongyloides. And if that is negative, often you need a transbronchial biopsy to see what kind of interstitial lung disease this is, be it from an exposure or um, uh, idiopathic. And so I think those would be the next step to rule out infection and to rule out blood. The question comes up about safety of bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy involves putting a tube in the lungs and in a patient who's hypoxemic is risky because it can make them more sick. So it is often only offered to patients at the extreme end of the spectrum. Either they're not, they only one or two liters. So even if they need a little more oxygen, no problem. Or they're intubated, in which case you already have secured their airway. So patients like him who are on high flow nasal cannula are often too sick for bronchoscopy unless they get intubated. So that's the management dilemma that would probably be happening in this case. Um, you can get sputum uh, PJP analysis. You can get strongyloides antibody, but those are both imperfect tests. So yeah, I think this is a tough clinical dilemma and the best the next most specific tests are bronchoscopy and transbronchial biopsy if needed. Uh, however, the dilemma will be, can I safely do those tests in this patient who is fairly sick? All right, Jazz, tell us more. Great, um, amazing discussion so far. So um, this will be the second last aliquot of information. Um, so the bronch was done. So his course in the ICU basically was pretty stable. He didn't get better, but he also didn't wor worsen to the point that needed to intubate him. So it was an interesting, like he was just kind of stable on the 14, 15 liters. Um, so they actually did decide to do a BAL and they sent off aerobic culture, um, gram stain for like nocardia, actinol, uh, mycin, and legionella. They did fungal culture and stain, AFB, a whole bunch of viruses, PJP. Uh, all of that came back eventually negative. Um, 
And considering that he wasn't completely improving on the antibiotics, um, we deci they decided to discontinue the ceftriaxone, but continue the doxycycline for atypical coverage. Um, and then at this time, he actually, over, over the next few days, he eventually came down from a high flow to like maybe eight liters nasal cannula. And the decision was uh, made to send him to the floors. And this is where I got involved uh, in my team. So when we picked him up, we got a call from the lab saying that um, his um, sample from the VAL may have, uh, they, have to review, they have to review the case, but it seems like the PSA, PAS staining was positive. Um, and at this point, he was stable. The BAL was already done. We decided to start um, steroids at 60 milligrams, uh, which is one milligram per kilo. And we're trying to monitor him. Um, and the next aliquot will reveal the final diagnosis. Sorry. I, I don't know what it is, PAS positive, but it's PAS. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the, this is a type of staining that they do, and I'm like not 100% familiar on it, but like I think it, it like makes the like uh, lipid rich cells uh, light up as pink. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, Robbie, but um, and I think it stands for like periodic acid shift staining, I believe, but. Um, it's, used, it's one of the stainings they use to look for that kind of material. Um, Jess, this is super, super helpful. Deborah, I think it's a good idea for us to be honest about what progress you can make. So imagine if you didn't know that what that is, what progress can you make from the other data that you have here? And then we'll be able to learn more from this test. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know what, what was that. I thought it was, a, I don't know, something in English, a medical abbreviation. So I was thinking maybe if with the antibiotics, the patient have some progression like and, and has a reduce on the liters of oxygen that maybe that is something good. And that could be like something from, from could be an infection that the antibiotic can be covering. and. Yeah, that was my fault. And what do you think? Yeah, no, I think, Deborah, the question will be in this case, GGO. Is it, do you think it's blood? What do you think about that? No, I don't think it's blood. Yeah, excellent. I, I, they didn't find any blood in the BAL, so gone, right? Blood is gone. Pus is interesting because he got better with antibiotics, like you just said, but his infectious testing is negative. So what do you think about pus? I think maybe like even if his infections can be positive that, um, oh, can be negative that we can repeat, you know, the exam that not like 100%. And I was thinking about pus, it could be uh, some bug that has like yeah. this, this and was detected in the exam, that's why it's positive. Excellent. So the PAS stain can detect some organisms, usually granulomatous organisms like mycobacteria and Whipple's disease, though those organisms don't usually cause this picture. So I love it. You know, you're not sure what this test does for you. And there's mixed evidence. He got better with antibiotics, but there's no organism. So I think you have to be humble about the fact that we don't know if it's infection. I'll also share with you that bronchoscopy sensitivity for bacterial infection is very, very low. Bronk can only confidently tell you about some infections. And the reason the BAL sensitivity for bacteria is very low is almost 100% of patients are given antibiotics before the bronchoscopy, including this patient who received vancomycin and zosin. So what are you going to see on the BAL culture? It's all going to be killed. So I completely agree with you. Blood gone, plus, plus minus, you know? Okay, now what do you think about cells or ILD? And so this is where I think these kinds of VMRs can uh, can teach you a lot about medicine because I don't know if you've learned anything new so far, Deborah. Everything you've like predicted and guessed. And I think now 
the PAS stain I will share with you in terms of interstitial lung disease. I don't know the test characteristics, but that PAS stain essentially picks up the uh, things that can accumulate in the pulmonary macrophages. And those things are two disorders, uh, pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, PAP, and lipoid pneumonia. Both of them are pretty rare. Have you heard of any of them before? Never. Good. That means you're studying medicine appropriately, learning common things first before you learn uncommon things. And I'll just share one quick line about each of them. Pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is a disease that occurs in kids or adults, and the underlying cause is different. In adults, it occurs as a result of either antibodies to uh, uh, GMCSF, granulite stimulating colony factor. So the antibody against GMCSF impairs macrophage function, and they start to accumulate protein so much that your lungs are full of protein and you no longer are able to have alveolar gas exchange. Um, the other form can be from hematological malignancies, which he doesn't have. So getting antibodies to GMCSF would be very helpful here. The other possibility is lipoid pneumonia and distinguishing lipoid pneumonia and pulmonary alveolar proteinosis is very tricky. However, um, you can do a specific fat staining to try to distinguish if it's um, lipoid pneumonia. And if you review the CT scan, often you can see uh, densities that are the density of fat. So you know how fat looks like a certain density on the CT? So basically this PAS positivity stain suggests either protein accumulation or lipid accumulation in the lungs, and further testing is needed to clarify which one of the two it is. But it goes back to your question. Exposure, exposure, exposure. If this is lipoid pneumonia, then you have to ask, how did he get lipid in his lungs? The most common ways are two of them. He has nasal congestion, and he was uh, applying um, things to his nose, and those Vaseline or things like that, and it goes right down into the lungs. Another, another way people get it is they use mineral oil um, for constipation, and that lipid material goes down into the lungs. The reason the lipid material goes down to the lungs very easily is because it does not induce a cough. Whenever you get lipid in your throat, it does not induce a gag or cough. It just slides down. So I think you were spot on from this from the beginning. This is an isolated pulmonary disease. And I think now the question is, is it protein or is it lipid? Any thoughts or clarifying questions, Zebra, before we learn from Jess? No, thank you. I want to learn more about this too. I'm sure you're learning. Yeah, Amazing. please, Jess, let us know. The diagnosis. Yeah, no, really great discussion by both you, Deb, and uh, Robbie. This case, like, was a so many twists and turns, which is why I decided to um, present it today. Uh, we learned a lot. So, one of the differentials that was on our list was um, COP or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. Uh, just the, but the fact that so when we started him on sixty milligrams of prednisone, he did not improve rapidly. Um, and so that made that less likely. And um, pulmonology also felt that, so there was a little bit of twist and like where initially the, the pathology report said that there, the PA, PAS staining was positive, but then pulmonology was like the pathologist, like, no, can you please review this again? Because it doesn't make sense. So even though crazy paving is not a specific finding for PAP, it's non-specific. There was no crazy paving when reviewed with the radiologist on the CT scan of his chest. Uh, secondly, the fluid, as Shema very uh, too astutely in the chat tried to delineate, was not milky. Um, and uh, thirdly, the uh, when they reviewed it carefully, the BLL fluid, fluid was neutrophil predominant. So. Um, the pulmonologist was not convinced that this was um, PAP. Uh, the other differential that uh, they had was uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But again, there was no eosinophils, no other things uh, in, in the BAL, so that seemed less likely. Um, pulmonology was actually convinced that because of the neutrophilic predominant BAL, that this was probably an atypical infection. And we send out further other, other things uh, 
uh, like mycoplasma pneumonia and other things, which all came back negative. So unclear of which atypical organism this was, we tested a whole bunch of other things. Everything came back on remarkable. But his, in terms of his course, we gave him a full seven seven day course of doxycycline. His oxygen requirement eventually throughout the hospitalization eventually came down to one liter. He was able to go home on one liter. And I just checked his outpatient notes um, as of last week. He was completely off oxygen, going back to his three to five mile walks and not requiring a, a single medication for this. So uh, it seem, seems like this is pretty convincing for a, a typical infection uh, that lingered for this long. Um, and doxycycline was the, the, uh, uh, the answer to this uh, puzzle, I guess. But um, yeah, I'm trying, so I think someone else, will, we were about to send out the GM CS, CSF antibodies for that, but apparently that has to be sent, sent out all the way to Cincinnati. So the, um, the pulmonologist was like, before we order this very expensive test, like, I don't, I don't, I want the pathologist to review it. So then when the pathologist reviewed the thing, they're like, oh, actually you're right. Uh, there's not enough PAS staining positive here. So uh, we're going to take back our initial read. So it also kind of gives you some, shed some light on when you, when you're an expert in one of the field, you've seen things so many times that this pulmonologist, she was very convinced that this was not PAP for, and had very good reasoning, teaching points of why it wasn't, so. Well, thank you, Jess. Really interesting case. Uh, make me think like sometimes, I don't know, we think it's a real life case that anything show positive, but maybe the treatment can reveal the diagnosis for us. And yeah, I learned a lot and I really wanna say thank you for you. What do you think, Robbie? I completely agree. I think it was really cool to see you, Deborah, jump into like higher level clinical reasoning every single time. And I know um, getting and growing in discussions is important to you. And I think you're demonstrating that over and over and over again. And I know how stressful that can be to answer questions off the fly. And yet you hit a home run every single time. And at the end of the day, I think this is such a great case to VMR. All, all too often our cases are rare, maybe rare diagnoses that have a clear ending, but this is so real life. And I think it goes to show you just how much uncertainty there is in medicine. And if you're being logical, I think you don't know exactly what happened to this person, but you know, he was almost died. He was basically peri-intubation and then he came back and got healed. So what helped him come back? It's either something that we gave him or something that he stopped being exposed to. And I don't know which one it is personally. Um, I think the doxy could have helped, the vank could have helped, the zosin could have helped, the steroids could have helped, or it could have helped that he was no longer at home getting exposed to something. And we'll never really know for sure. And at the end of the day, if you look at the last 20 years of how many new diagnoses we make, it's also very possible this is a diagnosis that somebody watching VMR 20 years from now will be like, oh, I know what this is. This is ABC or whatever. So I'm really excited for that. Um, so yeah, I think it's really important um, to get these reps in and to get this exposure and, and to see these kinds of cases that all too often don't get presented. So really, really appreciate you, Jazz, for discussing it and really appreciate you, Deborah, for locking in on what what where the path is and where to go next and why. And I think um, I learned a tremendous amount from, from being with, with you all here. Jazz, before we uh, pass the mic to Sarah for emphasis on the learning points, anything that you took away from the case that you want to emphasize? Yeah, no, uh, I think basically everything you guys summarized was, was my uh, intake. I think uh, Abraham asked a good question. Did they have followed up PFTs? And his PFTs were normal as well. And then the, we also, I, Robbie, just to your point, one thing I was going to say was we were also wondering, is it because he's getting better because he's not getting exposed to some type of environmental toxin? But the, the part that the pulmonologist explained to me about this was that like, Typically, those patients will get better, depending on what the toxin is and what the half-life and how long they get cleared. Typically, there's like a, a trajectory for that. And she doesn't feel like, she's like, that trajectory, she just feels like is more linear. She felt like his trajectory was like, was okay, got worse. And then like, then like plateaued. And then to the point where you have to send him home on home oxygen. And then she was like, also the great litmus test is, 
if he goes home and he and he continues to have like exacerbations, then we know that is. And then the most recent pulmonology note said that he's been doing great. So it was just so many twists and turns, and it like you know it made me feel very like uh, like oh my god, I got so much to learn, but but at the same time got me so excited. So, um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm glad that you guys enjoyed this case as much as I did. Thank you so much, Jess. There's so much nuance and expertise in these things that I uh, were so lucky to be able to learn from those experts and their attention to detail. You know, not not something I would know to do. All right, Sarah, take it home, please. All righty. I learned so much from this case. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm sorry, this was terrible construction noise in my background, but hopefully this will be clear. Um, I decided to break up the teaching points today into history, physical exam, and labs and imaging. So for history, um, we really narrowed down early that this was an isolated pulmonary syndrome due to the presence of both cough and hypoxemia. And in this case, the hypoxemia is the chief complaint with the most gravity because it both localizes the cough to the lungs and also carries more morbidity. So this drives the history to focus on um, things like pulmonary exposures, such as occupational exposures, fine dust, home and smoking, um, as well as changes in functional status over time. For the physical exam, um, the most notable finding was wheezing and we learned the pearl that all wheezes are not asthma. The differential still is broad, including airway obstruction, pneumonia, vocal cord dysfunction, GERD, um, et cetera. Um, and then most of our teaching pearls came from the labs and imaging information today. In the initial workup, uh, CK can be important to assess for autoimmune ILDs. And then there was discussion about this PAS or periodic acid shift staining, which detects polysaccharides, including glycogen and mucins. And it can be helpful in detecting infections more commonly, and more rarely it can detect things like pulmonary alveolar proteinosis, which is uh, a disease due to antibodies to GM CSF or hemalignancies, as well as lipoid pneumonia, which is due to aspiration of exposure such as Vaseline and mineral oil. On the CT chest, we discovered that the patient had ground glass opacities. So the approach in this case can be to divide um, the types of ground glass opacities into infectious blood and cancer. Um, for the infectious causes, the most common would be viral such as CMV, PJP, and strongyloides. For blood, this would be um, a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, which would present with hemoptysis and hematuria, and cancer, which would present with other systemic findings. And in this patient, the most, um, uh, the best next step would have been to do a bronchoscopy, um, or if unremarkable, a transbronchial biopsy. However, in cases of patients who are this sick, like in the ICU, it's important to consider the risks and benefits because patients who are this sick would likely need to be already intubated in order to do the bronchoscopy. And it's important to note that the bronchoscopy also has low sensitivity for bacterial infections, um, likely secondary to antibiotic exposure before the test is done. Um, and then the final diagnosis was an atypical pneumonia. We really found this through um, kind of the resolution of the case as opposed to any diagnostic test. And so the resolution could have been uh, could have happened due to a number of things such as choice of antibiotics, um, as well as removal from the exposure. However, we learned from Jazz that um, we would expect representations um, of this um, same kind of syndrome for this patient if exposure was the likely cause. Um, so yeah, these are all my teaching points. Thank you so much for all of the incredible learning and teaching today. Uh, just superb, Sarah, superb. Um, Thank you for taking us through that journey again and the, uh, the nuanced conclusion at the end. I really appreciate it. All right, I'll hope to see you around uh, maybe tomorrow for uh, RLR. Bye.